Hey everybody, uh, we're going to get started here in just a minute, and I um, just wanted to start off, I'm going to be reading my questions off of here to everyone uh, as we go along, but I um, want to start off with kind of the whole reason why we're doing this. I've had, oh, maybe two or three talks over the last couple months uh, or two focused on training older adults and how we do that, what our philosophy is, how we implement it. And I found myself kind of answering a lot of these questions the same way over and over and over again. So I figured, okay, let's try to put, put together something to make this a little bit more uh, inclusive, where I can kind of deliver everything a little bit more in one content or one, one format and one way to, to deliver all the content. And so this is kind of the, the bridging the gap uh, as opposed to um, recording another webinar or having a live talk at, at an event. So um, my whole kind of philosophy on training older adults has come from a lot of my personal experiences. If you don't, don't know my story much, in, in 2008 I had a, a back surgery, I had lung cancer, I had a thyroid a tumor, a variation of cancer there. I've had two hip replacements, two surgeries on my wrist, and just banged up my body every which way uh, you can think from throwing hammer and lifting and doing everything else. So um, through all those experiences and having the ability to focus on those and work as hard as I could to rehabilitate myself and build myself back up with the, the help of other really good professionals, Gary Schofield uh, and Gary, or excuse me, and Dan McLean, um, two really, really good friends of mine and great pros. They gave me a ton of good information on how to do this. Uh, Dan was pretty much here with me every step of the way, still coming to my house and doing cupping and stretching and doing all this good stuff for me. So through all that, learning from them, learning from my personal experiences has, has helped uh, kind of design uh, and, and create our blueprint for how we train older adults. So um, through that, that's some information I've been sharing. This is uh, our first question, uh, comes all the way over from Ireland uh, with Kieran. He asked, um, when you're specifically designing a philosophy, what are the key components that you focus on and um, how do you implement them with your clients? So I figured I'd just kind of throw this up here as a, as a, a general overhaul. Um, I have a, a much fancier version, I have my computer here, I can show you all in, in a couple of minutes, but I have a, a, a fancier version that kind of outlines all this, and then Rick Howard put in a question this morning asking how, um, how do we look at a client and say, do we need to, need to train them or build a philosophy or a program for them based off of increasing quality of life, so basically they're not able to stand, not able to move well, they have a lot of pain. We're just trying to get them back to a, a functional level versus we're training them for sport, we're training them for performance. And then, and, and so that's kind of inclusive in this. When we go through this, um, you'll be able to see a, a strong influence from Dan John, uh, one, one of the best pros in this industry, really had a big influence on me, hammer thrower, discus thrower. We both really kind of connected there, but this philosophy is implemented in with general pop, with people improving life quality, people that are working for ADLs or activities of daily living, but also on the other side of people trying to train for sport. And for us, I don't wanna look at this and say, you're, you're old, so you can't train this way, go sit on machines, go use the little weights. That crap bothers me more than anything else in this industry, is that we treat old people like they're old, and then, we, then we're like, oh, well, they're not very functional, they can't stand up straight. Well, you got them sitting on machines all the time. You've got them unable to lay down on the floor. 70% of people 70 and older cannot lay down on the ground and get up without help. Like, these types of things are what drive me nuts because, because the rest of the industry says this is how it's supposed to be done, then we just follow it, right? Instead of thinking for ourselves and saying like, we shouldn't do it this way, okay? We should create a philosophy where I have a 70 and an 80 year old that can train with my 30 year olds and I'm 36, train them with the 80 year olds, right? Like, it's about the philosophy and how you're able to progress and coach and cue a client based on their biological age, not their chronological age. And uh, you've seen some of my posts on, you know, the, the, the books and the textbooks and all this, and the client's always sitting down and they're always old and they always have little dumbbells. And I wanna see one swinging a kettlebell or pulling a sled, but anyway, tangent aside, that's the big issue. Quit treating old people like they're old. Let's just look at them and say, here's the level that they're gonna train at. So when we look at this, to answer Rick's questions, to answer Karen's question, we want to look at every workout to have one of these components. We need to have something where they're tracking and implement. Uh, either um, a, a lacrosse ball bouncing off the floor, a medicine ball off the trampoline, a medicine ball to a partner. But that coincides with balance. So not, not a, we're not big on like BOSU balls or balance boards, any of that kind of stuff. I want to have, we are the unbalanced implement. 
Uh, we have enough problems balancing ourselves, let alone balancing ourselves on something else that's unbalanced. So unless you're a surfer or skateboarder or something like that, we don't really do that. So I wanna get my, my person very balanced on their own, capable of balancing staggered in line, in line, one foot, one foot with an implement, one foot losing and catching an implement. So these start to merge together. And then we have a little checklist with these. Are they capable of doing these? What we're kind of creating, we call the blank slate. Can I check them off in each of these and all the progressions in each category to the point where I can just kind of pick anything? It doesn't always mean, Nick Tuminello gave a really good talk on this a couple weeks ago. Once you train somebody up to a point, it doesn't mean you just stay at the high point. You've trained them through all of these abilities. Now we can use anything. They are the blank slate now. And I, and I love that, that philosophy. So implement tracking and balance work really well together. Then we have what we call hinging and then hinging with a bent knee. I find that's just so much better way to teach two people what I'm looking for, to hinge and then to hinge first and then bend your knees, which we call squatting or deadlifting, right? So it's just a, a, a mindset or a philosophy for us of how we teach it. We have rows, presses, raises. We kind of include all of those as upper back, shoulder, shoulder. What we don't do is a horizontal plane or horizontal pushing. Uh, we really try to avoid that as best we can just because of this position all the time. I'd rather spend my 245 minutes here uh, every week than uh, working on anything else. A split stance, um, walking, long step walking, lunging, step ups, all supported, all suspended, unsuspended, loaded, overhead loaded, carry, I mean, however we wanna take the weight, whatever positions we can put them in, fast walking, running, pulling sleds, pushing sleds, all those variations. And then loaded carries, I'm big on carries, I love carrying stuff. FBAs, what we call floor-based activities. So something where the ground is more than just something for me to stand on. Uh, a bear crawl, a get up, uh, something along those lines, uh, you know, where we're, we're utilizing the ground as a space area that we have to move through. And then this is a new one that I'm, I've just kind of put in the last few days called manipulation strength. And uh, the way I want you to think of it, um, a day after my last hip surgery, my hip dislocated and I had to have another surgery. And when I got home, I was scared to death and still have, <laughs> have flashbacks of my leg just falling off. Uh, but I would have these nightmares where I'd be laying on my side in the bed and my leg would drop off the other one and it would dislocate. So I would sleep more towards the center of the bed with pillows and all this around me. So when I would wake up in a California king size bed, I would, I would have to kind of like bridge and lift my butt up and then manipulate my shoulders. My butt up, my shoulders, my butt up, my shoulders. And I would have to like wiggle myself to the side. Well, finding that component, the ability to manipulate my body weight in different directions or different areas or angles or be able to roll myself up off the ground or out of bed, that's actually become a component for us working with older pops. Uh, Pre-surgery, uh, pre, you know, fa fairly big uh, physical limitation, whatever their inju injury might be, that, that again, they're, they're cleared to work with you on. But then post-surgery as well, had my hips not been able to glute bridge and all this, uh, again, a huge thing. I, I'm very lucky to have found Brett Contreras and all the glute bridge training uh, a couple of years ago. If that hadn't happened, my hips would have been a lot worse. So learning to be able to, to manipulate, bridge, move our body weight, those are kind of our six areas that we include. Uh, Karen, to answer your question, and then Rick, we go through our checklist on these, and as someone's capable to do more, we will train them in a more traditional athletic form. But we need to kind of go through that checklist to get to the point where they're the blank slate, we can do anything. Now, if their goal is for athletic performance, um, I always joke and say, I think we have two athletes in here, but all of our clients are athletically minded. So they'll train and challenge themselves like they're athletes, but they're not necessarily out there competing and running 10Ks or marathons or any of that kind of stuff, right? So we're athletically minded. We're, we're encouraging, challenging, pushing, striving for the next thing. We, we track power output on bikes. We're in one right now where we're doing max mile per hour on the bike, uh, which is the best power output for us to test with our clientele. Like every, we'll do, we're doing a wall sit challenge right now to see who can wall sit the, the longest, like all that kind of stuff. We kind of incorporate things in that are still a very competitive mindset, okay? Um, do your clients in small groups start out private one-on-one -on -one or do they go straight to groups? That's from John. Um, we have kind of along the same lines. In most cases, pretty much all cases, we'll start with at least one one-on-one -on -one session. Just to go through our mobility menu, our, our movement prep, teach the basic components, make sure the client knows how to move. A lot of times they're former athletes that were you know, collegiate athletes, they know how to move, they're just they lacking the motivation or really knowing what to do at this time. So 
we'll do that one or two sessions. I've had other clients where it's been five, six months and we're still doing one-on-one -on -one, or uh, they'll bring in a friend. I, we have one client that had a stroke almost three years ago and then she was able to work in with another client who had a stroke. So we kind of built like a, a little group of, and they're golfers, so they're called, their group's called the Stroke Group, which stroke, golf, stroke, anyway. Uh, they, they have um, no pun, like, well, pun intended, but that really is the name of their group. So they go golfing together, but then they train in here, and so that's kind of the emphasis of the group. They created their own group, right? And then we train them for that protocol or for that goal outcome. So. We can start on a one-on-one, -on -one. we can kind of build to a point or a process where they either create or, or bring in more people of their own to kind of start a small group, or if we get them to a point where they're capable, um, you know, we're able to check off a lot of this, they're comfortable, they're, they're comfortable with our cueing and our coaching to where if we have a couple other people in the room, things will be okay, they'll go good, but if we need that direct one-on-one -on -one attention, um, I personally feel like I'm a better group coach than I am a one-on-one -on -one coach. Uh, I think they're very different strategies, Not a, not, not every coach that trains one-on-one -on -one is 100% focused on that person the whole time when they're one-on-one. -on -one. I can pay better attention to two, three, four people at one time than I can one. I feel like I, my mindset kind of goes to sleep a little bit, where if I have four, I'm like, I have to be on. I have to be paying attention, you know? So I feel like I do better that way, but to each their own in that sense. So yes, we'll start that way. We'll, we'll kind of go through, we'll, we'll, we'll check off what we need to check off and say you're good, and then we'll move them into the group if we can. Uh, after creating a blueprint, and building, um, building that to a certain point, how do you, what do you recommend to do next? What's the next bit? Well, well number one, uh, to steal a, a line from Dan John, I have this in almost every presentation I do. I heard him say this in Seattle in like 2009, I think. It's something along this, but he says, 80% of your programming that you're doing now is good. 10% you're in the process of learning right now. 10% you don't even know about. And you, you're gonna need to continue to learn about it. Or it's something along those lines. Don't Obviously, don't quote me, but the, the thought process is, is you know some good stuff, you're implementing some things now. You're in the constant process of learning and there's so much more out there to, to learn that you have to keep on that. Uh, Alan Cosgrove talks about the, you know, being the tip of the spear on the cutting edge of anything new coming out. We have to test it, we have to read about it, we have to know, is this something we wanna implement? And so constant education and always moving up, that's the first part. We, I'm always in a process, like we talked about adding manipulation strength enough to where it's not its own category, but it can kind of be included in there. Um, two weeks ago, that wasn't there. And so we, we're in, always in a process of rethinking, rebuilding, reading more and more, and trying to um, critique and master this product or build this product to a point where we're like, this is it. This is exactly what we want. This is the, you know, the best product that we can produce at this moment. It will never be perfect, right? But we're always trying to build our product to a point where we're like, this is as good as we know right now. And, and so that's, that's the next step, in my opinion. O outside of that, what we're building right now is I have a philosophy for training my older pops. We have a, a philosophy for our, our, again, recreational power lifters uh, that we build in there. We have our general strength and conditioning, general population. Uh, we have a program for that. And then outside of each one of those, I'm in the process now of building, um, if I have a client uh, that is going to start with the base hinge, which for us is a, a body weight glute bridge, and they're going to build all the way up. What cues am I using for each of those? What progressions am I using for each of those? And I'm building basically a timeline of exercises to where if we work with a client to a point and we know like that's where they're at right now and we try to progress one and it doesn't work and we have to regress, it's a ton of work. It's just this, it's kind of like a, I don't want to say a drop down menu, but it's just this timeline of movement that I'm in the process of building right now. It's so personalized and every, every person is so different that it's hard to say like do this next step. Some cases you might need to jump or go back, but I wanna get something down. So that's, that's my next step in this. Uh, again, it's hard to say specifically, John, like where, where you're at, or excuse me, that's from Nelson, um, specifically where you're at and, and where to go with the next thing, but always know that you're gonna, you're gonna need to master your product, you're gonna need to build your product to this next level. There's always more to learn and the more progressive you get with your systems, the better you're gonna be as a trainer, you're better you're gonna be as a coach, because you're just gonna keep, you know, keep correct, progressing people even that much more efficiently. Uh, do you have any recommendations bringing old clients into a small group uh, training and eventually improving their quality of life? So, uh, and that's another question from John. There's uh, a challenge, we've had clients, uh, I had one client that I trained in my house for a while, because. Our goal wasn't fitness based and I, and I know as soon as I say that people are well, you were doing rehab it wasn't rehab the guy is perfectly capable 
Um, he had sensitivity issues. He had sensitivity to light. He had sensitivity to sound, right? Um, so we brought him into our house. He's a friend of ours. And we would dark out the room and we'd turn off the TV and my wife would go, you know, go in the other room. We'd take our dog and we'd train him and we would, you know, really basic stuff, kind of build up some basic levels of strength. Then we get to the point where I could do it with the blinds open. Then we do it to the point where I could have some music on or Keegan could be in the room. We're like, okay, you're getting better. Let's try moving to the gym now. We'd come into the gym this time of day. Nobody here, we'd black the place out. We'd start the whole process over, but in a new environment, right? So I'm not rehabilitating anyone. I'm just, we're training him now for improving his quality of life, not necessarily a performance outcome, right? So I'm very comfortable and capable doing that. We had his uh, behavioral counselor was with us, kind of coaching us along the way. He also went to Dan, our physical therapist, and he was working with him along the way. And, and everything worked really well as we progressed. So we could look at that and say, let's do these one-on-ones, let's build the same, kind of the same as before, let's get them to the blank slate and then we can merge to the group or find you know, others that are just like that or same issues that we need to build into a group. Um, but outside of that, if it's not an improved quality of life necessarily, then it's a, a training goal. I have this event coming up, I wanna look better for this, or I have this sporting event or this sporting product that I would, you know, I'm gonna go be a part of. So um, the same process occurs, we go through all of our pre-screening, our assessment, all our health history, all that good stuff. We, uh, another way I look at this too is, I don't really ask the client what time they wanna come in, um, because I have a certain time and a certain product available that fits their need, uh, not necessarily what time fits their schedule best. So we have a variability that might be a little confusing, but if you're here for a fat loss strength gain, I have a group like that at five, I have a group like that at seven, and I have a group like that at 10. Uh, which one of those works best for you? As opposed to, well, I wanna be here at 6.30. Well, our 6.30 group's our strongman training group, and you're here for fat loss strength gain. So I need to put people where they fit best. I need to give them the product that fits their demand best, not necessarily just their time. My situation is a little different than most. Uh, most people don't have a, a big enough space to do uh, that type of thing as an independent. We're sharing the gym and such, I get that. But when you have the abilities to do that, that's, that's your system and how you can build it, okay? Um, does power training need to be addressed for older people? Yes, uh, and when, how do you know uh, how hard to push them if you feel like they're very fragile to start at a certain point? That's from Tom. Um, power training for us, I mentioned it with the bike. We could look at this as a regular athlete or a regular client and say, Okay, we could do power cleans, we could do snatches, we could do a broad jump, we could do a vertical jump, um, we could do a, a seated med ball chest pass, any of the other power protocols. With a lot of those, uh, our populations either don't know how to do them, it's too technical, or they have a physical limitation that won't let them do it. So the best one that we found, um, a lot of our clients' hips and back issues, we don't use the rower, we use the airdyne bikes. And we have that uh, maximal speed component on the bottom middle of the screen where for 10 to 15 seconds, we'll just have them gas it. Just, and we just did this last week. We're in an eight week cycle right now on power production where we're gonna have like a two to three exercise focus each week on power production, moving weight fast. And we're gonna see if we can't translate that into this. Now, do, do I, you know, am I gonna just blanket say all my older clients don't jump and leave the ground? No, I mean, we would love to be able to do that, but a lot of them cannot. So we need to have different components for them to, to be able to still be inclusive, to work towards our power goal. We know that by increasing their power production, we're, we're working on a, a whole vast majority of things, but especially with our you know, 60s, 65s and up, bone density is a big issue, a big focus for us. Um, post, uh, posture with the, the rack pulls, with our hex bar deadlifts, those strength-based, when we get to move those fast, we're able to increase and work on power production. Between our sprints there, um, we do a variation of a swing and release, if you know, uh, like World Strongman, where they're trying to throw the keg over or the weight over the upright. We do a variation of that outside with sand balls. We have four pound, six pound, 10 pound sand balls. Um, you can see the influence of thrower uh, onto our people with that. So the traditional power movements that you would think of clean snatch, jumping, uh, plyos, we don't necessarily embrace a whole lot uh, just because of the, the demand of our clientele. So we gotta think about those things a little bit differently in how we would put that in there, but it is a very big component for us. Uh, I will say that we will address strength as the name of our business be stronger fitness we will address strength for a very long period before we get to a point of like true power training with someone uh, just to make sure we're, we're, we're treating them as safely as we can how do you differentiate between old clients who have not exercised and old clients who want to be competitive uh, this is uh, i'm getting text messages from my clients right now saying they're feeling good um, this was the second part of rick's talk um, I, I think the the checkoff 
for uh, the the check off for our client to kind of see not only what their goals are but what their abilities are really dictates to us how we're going to train them and what we're going to progress them into. The philosophy is great. We want to have a philosophy that we can apply to any and every client, but there are going to be components that will branch off. Um, when I say we have a recreational powerlifting team, if I have a guy come in here and say, I hear you're a powerlifting coach, I want to try to make it to you know, nationals, I want to be on the cover of magazines, I want to get sponsored, I'm, I'm so not your guy. I mean, Mark Bell is here, like, we, we have so many other people that could do this. But I have a client that wants to lift, she wants to be strong, she wants to go and compete, I got you, right? Um, you know, we, I got Wendler's book, 531, we started learning about this four or five years ago, we compete, she's a record holder, like we're pumped, you know? But it's recreational. So if I have clients that wanna compete in a recreational sport, coming from sport background, from CSCS, master's degree in sports science, the idea is the same as a college coach. Can I train a client or a student for sport. Do I need to know about rowing to train them for it? No. Do I need to know about wrestling to train them for it? No. Do I need to know what components are needed and where they need to be strong? Absolutely. And so it's the same thing for us. What are our clients working on? Not to play to stereotypes, but a lot of them, as far as athletics go, they garden, they play golf, they play tennis, they walk. And so we address our programming to that. You see my, my periodization up here. Our, our macro cycle, if you will, on this is 12 weeks long because we don't really have like a culminating event. I mean, we have golf season, but in, in California, you can golf almost year round. You can play tennis year round. We garden all the time. So there's really not a, a peak in season, off season, preseason. We don't have that. So we have a 12 week cycle that we think works really well. And then we repeat that and our clients can merge in and incorporate in as we go. So we have our macro cycle, we have our breakdowns, we have our progressions, we have our emphasis. We have focuses on strength. We have uh, one small or two small little weeks in there where we're working on hypertrophy. And then we have components where we're implementing power and focused on power. And so just like any other athlete would train or any other component, it's just very much tailored to our older population. So, um, you know, Rick brings up a really good point in another message he sent me. Um, we, we have this term and, and he, he likes to include me in a lot. I'm going to speak at a, an event of his in December. Um, because of what we do, the, the term LTAD, long-term athletic development, most people in the industry think that means, you know, from five to 18. So youth, um, when long-term, as Rick says, and others say as well, it's from, from cradle to grave. And so we have, I have the later end of that. Uh, and, and that is the focus is, if we can get really good coaches that are implementing and working a full body incorporated, not leg day, arm day, chest, you know what I mean? We're, getting, we're training the full body every day like most athletes would. If we can implement that as a young age, and after decades of training, build people to the point where when they get to me, they're still pretty capable and functional, but there's this huge gap in there right now between like 19 and 65, basically when people think, okay, I'm gonna retire, I need to start taking care of myself, maybe a little before that, there's this huge gap where so much damage is done, right? So we need to be, especially personal trainers, physical therapists, independent strength coaches working with general pops, we need to be that bridging gap, but we need to have a philosophy and an idea and a progression and a team of people that are gonna help us do this right. Um, I had my cousin over last night and, and uh, I was telling him, I'm like, I, I, I hate to present it this way, but most of us personal trainers, we're not so great at this. And most of physical therapists know that. And so the relationship is not great when we really should work really well together. The strength coach, the personal trainer, the behavioral counselor, the nutritionist, registered dietitian, you know, that we should all work together to help build people instead of feeling like we have to compete or that the others don't know enough. But there's not a lot of trainers out there that are doing this kind of stuff that have had influences uh, and, and you know the experiences that I've had or that some of our others around here have done. So it's a learning, like I, I've said before, this industry is a, it's a crock pot, right? We, it's a slow cook. We have to build and, and gather information, slowly get better at this, but we're gonna continue to make this type of process and work with older populations so much better as the whole industry kind of grows and comes together. So. Um, I, I didn't see any other questions that popped in. There might have been a, a couple on here live. Uh, I want to do this again. I'd love to get into more stuff. Uh, I don't want to keep this to like 15 or 20 minutes. So if you enjoyed this, uh, feel free to send a couple comments on there if you want me to do this again. I am live in our gym right now. I can give you a quick little run around on this. Uh, but you see all of our workouts that we put up uh, on here on a, on a daily basis. You've probably seen some of my videos where I'm putting up the timeline of us doing this. So we're in our facility right now. 
Uh, I can do some live demos and some other events and type stuff in here where we're showing people uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it. I'm happy to do that if that's something that everybody wants to do. So just give me, uh, give me some feedback on there. Um, I love doing this. I'm happy to continue doing it. I just want to make sure there's a demand for it and that you all, uh, you all are interested. So uh, email me, let me know, send me a message on there, comment below. Uh, I also have all of this in paper form and PDF. I have, I have no problem sharing that out. Just shoot me a message, let me know you want it, robertlinkle at gmail.com. And uh, that's about it. Thank you everybody that sent in questions. If you have other ones, send them. I'll get to them next time. And uh, that's it. Have a great day. Thank you.